everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I'm the author of four books on cycling with three set to come out starting in 2019 as part of the Shred Girls series. Getting very close to being able to announce dates on that, but in the meantime, just kind of writing, yogaing, biking, and prepping for a 50k run in a couple weeks. Who And I blame our guest today for this, actually. And I'm Peter Glassford. Molly's co-host here on The Consummate Athlete, and I am an endurance coach and a kinesiologist, which I usually say the other way, but I mixed it around today. I've been doing more endurance coaching than kinesiology, and so, yeah. I heard but, someone on a different podcast trying to use the word kinesiology, and it did not come off right. Well, were they like the kooky type of kinesiology? Because there's like a kooky type, too. I can't remember what they do, but they do something about... Kinesiologist or something? Oh, I don't know. Apparently it involved holding a loaf of bread above your head, and if it made your arm hurt, then you were allergic to wheat. Oh, so they were kooky. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, there's like some weird type, and I'd have to look it up. We had to do a test, I remember, in school on like all the different kooky types of things, but... Should I be holding bread? Uh, I don't know. Like, you could rub it on your face or something and just <laughs> see. Like... All right, so I'm not going to do that. Um so what have we what have we been up to this week? Just thinking of doing <laughs> tweets that are like hashtag kinesiology, <laughs> just like a spam. The Ontario kinesiology board's gonna come after well, me. Well, I did just make sourdough bread, so if anyone is in a great position to be lifting bread, oh well, I mean sourdough bo- bread. That's not gonna give you a rash, right? It's yeah, it just health. kind of like vibrates ha- a ha- little in your hand. You but hashtag health on that one. Yeah. For the record, kinesiology, very professional and regulated in Ontario, so I must say that I can't give out medical advice, but it is indeed a regulated uh, or affiliated health, allied health profession, so... I gotta go get some bread. I don't know. Anyway, that's actually my biggest news for the week, was I I made a loaf of sourdough bread. It did not rise as much as I was I guess that counts towards the, the consummate athlete lifestyle. I'm working on it. Yeah. I also did a ton of running with uh, with people and by myself. Community, yeah, another important part. Another important part. And kind of like the main topic actually around today's show. So most exciting thing ever for me. Uh, today's guest is actually Chris McDougal. You guys might know him as the author of Born to Run or Natural Born Heroes. I mean, Born to Run pretty much inspired a lot of people to a switch to barefoot shoes and we get into that one a little bit but also b start ultra running uh i definitely have chris to blame for that i got my hands on born to run gosh probably the year after it came out and was fascinated by it um and i've probably read it every year since so there's a little bit of fangirling in this episode i'm not gonna lie yeah we we sell the book pretty good pretty well um (laughs) But it's definitely like if you have any interest in reading generally, any interest in running, I don't even know if you need an interest in running, to be honest. Um, But it's just he he's tremendous at weaving a narrative like a a non it would be nonfiction book. Creative nonfiction. Yeah. But just making it seem like this crazy story. And a lot of authors and books, especially right now, try and do that. But it comes off either too sciencey or too, I don't know, like almost too they're trying too hard with the fiction and this one just really weaves together a really nice narrative of you know different uh groups that have been running historically for a long time and then you know the sort of north american runners who have been you know ultra running and then sort of colliding at different events so to speak and then sort of his chris's own uh experience sort of running and relearning to run yeah so we talk about that we talk about his book natural born heroes and we talk a little bit about his latest project which he can't give us too many details about but it involves donkeys which i'm very excited about and we both take several tries at trying to get mentions in the book molly may have succeeded i think mine fingers are, crossed mine are going to be less significant but that's fine <laughs> It was it was super rad talking to him, and he was totally living the consummate athlete lifestyle while he was on the phone. He was like fighting goats on a, sitting on a grassy knoll or something. Yeah, every once in a while you hear like a bat kind of noise coming. He's like, "Oh, sorry, that's the goats." So we're just like, "No, that's great. Get them on the phone." 
uh, yeah, it's a super, super fun episode. I'm really excited to have him on. It was good inspiration for me because, as you guys know, I've been talking about it a lot. I have a 50K mountain run coming up in just a couple more weeks that I'm progressively getting more and more nervous about. I'm not going to lie. Well, it's good to be scared of stuff. That's uh, my, my new friend Ray told me that today. He's actually done a couple of Under Armour's mountain running series races in the past month. And I told him I was starting to freak out a little bit. And he was like, oh, that's good. I was like, I don't think you understand. I'm quite freaked out. But it's going to be fun. I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, I was just going back through actually just to pull out some quotes for an article. The couple sports psychologists we've had on, um, Tracy... Do you remember Tracy's last name? Stannard. Yeah, Tracy Stannard, and then we had Danielle Kabush, and then we had the Brave Athlete, Brave Athlete folks on as well, and we did a Q&A about race nerves as well. So I sort of was going through those four and just re-listening to them and pulling out some of the ideas, and there's definitely some, some good content there, some good quotes. and I'll have to listen to them before I leave because I remember at the Killington stage race I was at, I got yelled at by a lot of people because we had released our pre-race nerves episode right. as people were on their way to that race and they actually got more nervous in the car listening to well, it. Well, and you're doing, I mean, I always, I have my, my clients that have been with me long enough sort of make fun of me of, for the things that I just say in a redundant fashion, but I think that's a large part of the job is to be that person with the never-ending stream of redundancies redundancies um <laughs> but gameplay is sort of the big one i sort of harp on and it just you just don't do anything different like it shouldn't be that different so you're doing a good job of slowly inching you know you're going out to run i think tomorrow you said at 7 a.m yeah. and we've yep. been out for a couple early morning runs and you have your pack or it's not even a pack it's like a vest an elaborate bra strap yeah i don't like it yeah it's but the vests are cool actually one of my other clients has one for gravel like i think in gravel the vests are it's like a vest he has but it's sort of a hydration yours is a hydration yeah. pack though too sort of um but the vests are big so you're Not you're that. testing that because they certainly packs will rub people in different places depending on what type of hunch you got so mm -hmm. There's that, and then socks and shoes you've been trialing a bunch. So it's really just, like, that's the stuff that really ruins your day. Like, I mean, if you're motivated and you just don't do anything stupid the week of the race, like, as long as you show up and work hard, it'll go fine. There are 3,000 meters of climbing. 90% of life is showing up. Ugh, that's no. another redundancy that yeah. I didn't really make up. I think it was 80% and I changed it to 90 because everyone says 80, and I was just like, no, like, legitimately, you just have to show up. And have done some sort of preparation and you'll do fine in most situations. I don't know about this one. Anyway, before we get into it, just a quick reminder that we are a podcast on the Wide Angle Podium Network. And the network does a ton of awesome stuff for us and for the other shows on it. And I mean, it's the reason that this episode is streaming through your headphones right now, actually. They pay the bills. They do. They do. I, mean, I think someone's yeah. paying them anyhow. I hope. Anyway, uh, if you want to help out, they're an NPR styled network, so they basically are, you know, are constantly crowd fundraising, I guess is the way to put it. So you can go to wideanglepodium.com slash donate. You can donate just like five bucks a month. You can do a one time donation. You know, you can do more than that, it would be fantastic. Uh, but you know, helps us keep the lights on, help uh, helps us keep getting better microphones and I think it's it's that there's that there's the uh, hosting is definitely a big thing right like where do all these audio files go you know that's a large part of this the cloud space how yeah. many how many racks on racks do you have you always think podcasting is you know oh I just have like a little microphone and a computer and we're good but there's it's a bit more involved than that it's gotten simpler but there's still you know you still have to deal with hosting and yeah. you know the the better we try to make it you know the higher price it is to get these microphones and all that fun stuff so anyway wideanglepodium.com slash donate would be awesome uh yeah and with that let's get into the show with chris mcdougall so excited about this uh enjoy it guys I wanted to I wanted to just start with your Twitter bio. I mean, obviously you're the author of Born to Run and Natural Born Heroes, but then the second sentence kind of caught me out. Currently working on a new project with a donkey named Flower. Uh, what? Yes, yeah. Well, good for you with the detective's eye to sleuth that one right out because you know oh. usually people just blaze right by the bios. Hang on, uh, hang on, wait for it. Flowers. I actually looked up donkeys named Flower in an attempt to figure <laughs> out what the heck this was. 
<laughs> you thought it was like covert operations? I'm actually working for the Navy SEALs or something? Like, this is actually the code name for like yeah. taking people out, out of Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, what I did find though <laughs> is it is the world's oldest junkie who I believe passed in 2012. Hang on a second. Hang on. Back up. I don't know this. So the world's oldest donkey. The I, world. I'm sorry. I yeah. Just, yeah. I just. I just alerted the geese behind me. They're yelling. Um, <laughs> yes, it's important that, to know uh, that Christopher down? is outside on the top of a hill, so yeah. he's very much outside. <laughs> it's actually too bad we're not doing this by video because I'm. I'm actually ringed by creatures. There's eight geese and about seven or eight sheep and two goats. <laughs> Like, but it's literally surrounding me, like, um, being, like, hunted. Um, so, hang on a second. So, the world's oldest donkey was named Flower and passed away recently? Passed away in 2012 at the age of 70. I did not know this, and this is not the flower in question. Damn. Um, <laughs> but could but potentially now, get weaved into your narrative now. Hmm. Absolutely will be. And actually, Molly, you just got yourself a footnote. So, <laughs> Life goals. All right, I, I, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Um, there's now another footnote, too. Some guy in Philly at the uh, Philly Half Marathon. Oh, what was the sign? Shoot. At, at the Philly Half Marathon, he held up some sign, and it's so perfectly Philly. It was, like, so antagonistic and, and, and ugly that I included it in the book and then gave this dude a footnote for alerting me to this little handheld sign. Uh, and now I've got to alert people that I did not know about the world's oldest donkey until you told me about this. Uh, right. Good to know. But that was actually an unintended um, side effect of this project that we're doing. We, you know, we ended up adopting these three rescue donkeys, and no one told me the donkeys actually habitually lived to be about 50 years old. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm 56. So I don't think I'm going to outlive these guys, which means somebody is picking up some cranky old donkeys in about 30 or 40 years from now. I don't know who that's going to be. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to, oh, for the answer to your question, though, um, what happened was when my daughter was eight, for some reason, for her birthday, she asked for a donkey. Which, sure. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. Who, who doesn't? And by some weird circumstances, Oh, pardon me. Um, we had a, a, so we live out here in Amish farm country. Actually, I'm going to have to stop for one second. I got a little bug in my throat. Hang on. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> like that wasn't in your ear. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> the perils of recording outside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm up on the hill, actually. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, bugs and things flying around. So, <clears throat> Sorry about that. So, yes, yeah, so my, my daughter asked for a donkey. And we, we live out here in Amish farm country. And so it wasn't actually an immediate no. It was kind of immediate, like, yeah, all right, let's just see if we can find a donkey. <laughs> so we asked around, and one of our Mennonite neighbors said they actually had someone in their church who was a hoarder, and he had some animals that they were trying to get out of his care. So we went over to take a look at this donkey, and it was in, like, horrible, horrible shape, mm-hmm. locked up in this, this pen. And so my daughters and I immediately said, yeah, we'll do it. We'll take this animal. And then I had to go home and explain to my wife that not only were we getting a donkey, but we're getting a donkey on, like, death watch. <laughs> so we got this uh, animal away from this guy, and we had a, a friend not too far away who's really good with horses and donkeys, and she came over and trimmed his hose and, and cleaned them up. And she said, look, he's, he, he's pretty close to the point where you should put him down for his own sake. But if he pulls through this, you cannot just, like, tie a bow on his ass and stick him out in the field like Eeyore. You've got to do something with this animal. He's been abandoned. He needs a job. Like, he needs something to do. I'm like, well, what do you do with it? Like, what kind of job? Am I going to give a donkey? You know, like, a good prospect for gold? <laughs> but then I, I knew about these barrel races in Colorado, and I, I just got this idea of, like, you know, I wonder if this dude can actually be my running partner. Like, can I teach this animal how to go running with me and run with him every day? And that became what it was all about. So that one rescue donkey grew into three rescue donkeys. And me having this idea grew into um, training for the uh, World Championship Pack Pro Races in Colorado. And that's what we've been working on for the past three years now, like training and running with donkeys. Oh, my gosh. Is that, like, there's something yeah. around Leadville, which I know you're familiar with. Like, it's between, <laughs> Just like a little familiar I think it's with the it. week ahead of the bike. Leadville race. They do like a borough race, but that's not the world championships, is it? 
Well, what happened was the race originally was um, alternate years in Leadville and Fair Play. So it, it's actually, here's a curious little fact for you. Actually, Molly, you, you'll especially appreciate this as a woman. So, you know, the oldest marathon in the country is the Boston Marathon. Mm -hmm. But women were only allowed in the Boston Marathon toward the late 70s. So right. really, for all Americans, for all Americans, the Boston Marathon is not the oldest marathon. For all Americans, the oldest marathon in America is the Leadville Fair Play Pack Bar Race. Because mm. that began in the 1950s, and it was men and women, all comers were invited from the get-go. And when you ask the old-time, you know, uh, Pack Bar people about this, they're like, Look, out here in the West, we know that women are just as tough as the guys. Like, you don't live out here unless you can pull your weight. So we're not like your fancy East Coast elitist where we got to take care of the women. Out here, if you want to run for 27 miles with a donkey, be my guest. So I, I can make the argument that the oldest marathon in America is actually the, um, the pack bar race. So it began in the 50s, and uh, miners would take the donkeys, and they would run across the mountain from fair play to Leadville, and in the alternate year, they would go back the other way. And again, yeah, it, it was 27 some miles up and over the mountain, and it would go bar to bar. So it started a bar in Leadville and ended a bar in Fair Play. Were the donkeys allowed in the bar? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> um, and that was like the big thing was they would just open the doors, and the donkeys and the runners, you know, it started off to be like four people. So, you know, four, four people and Four donkeys would crowd in the bar and drink a bunch of shots, and then someone would come with trailers and bring everybody home. Fantastic. So, yeah. So, this project, how did it go? Can you give any spoilers on, on how Flower the Donkey did? I think I'll hold that back for now. Okay. Um, but I will say, which was kind of cool, is that what it opened my eyes to were. Um, two things you know one is we've really lost this animal human partnership tradition which is really so important to human life for most of our existence on the planet you know for millions of years we were always around with animals we always partnered with animals mm -hmm. and it's only relatively recently in the past say, 100 years or so that we kind of severed that link you know we, we don't ride horses we don't milk our own cows we don't have hunting dogs we don't hunt and so something that was crucial to human development for millions of years suddenly abruptly stopped. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we're starting to feel the effects. You know, the fact that we have companion therapy dogs, that they bring dogs into cancer wards and pediatric units, that people with stress disorders and depression uh, find themselves helped by animals, I, I think speaks to the fact that we don't really know exactly what it is that we lost. You know, we, we thought we knew it all, and now we're realizing there's some instinct that draws us back to, to animals when we are in need. So that opened my eyes to that. And the second thing, and, and Peter, I'd really be curious to get your viewpoint on this, is that I feel in some ways I'm, I'm at odds with most of the endurance and athletic community because I feel like competition is the worst. I feel like it is really <laughs> undercut. It has really undercut most people's participation and enjoyment because if you open runner's world, it's the same thing over and over again. Run your fastest 5K. Get the best stuff to run the fastest 5K. You know, New York Times has had this piece about those, like, new Nike shoes. And you're, you're running 4% faster. Like, who gives a shit? Who fucking cares? Sorry about the language. That's quite all right. It's okay. And, and it's, it's probably it's warranted. Focused, <laughs> it's, it's all focused on pushing yourself into the red zone. And the thing about animals is, especially donkeys, you, you can't do that. If I tell Flower to run faster and Flower doesn't want to, guess who's winning that argument? So, uh, I don't know, Peter, I, I'm curious, how do you feel? I mean, do you feel like competition has gotten, is in some ways spoiling people's um, enjoyment of sports? I think um, there's a few things I want to say. Um, but the I think you're right that what we're seeing, you know, I just was having a, conversation with a couple of coaches here we're at national championships and i think what we're seeing is like everyone's especially with kids but i think with everyone you know it's so race focused there's strava now everything's time and race focused and we're missing you know what used to be 99 percent when i grew up racing or you know riding bikes it was 99 percent us just out screwing around riding down to get cokes at the store and then riding to do dirt jumps and then 
you know, I guess, quote right. unquote, quote unquote training, but it often didn't feel like that. We were just riding. And then you'd go to a right. race, you know, once or twice a month or something, right? Um, or a weekly race. And it was often just fun. And I think that is more in line. If you think about like born to run, um, you know, some of that, like there's such a community element, to any of the, the racing they were doing. Right. Um, and, and to your point, I think more of a functionality to it a lot of times. Um, so I, I think you're a hundred percent right. I don't know that it's all bad. It's like anything, there's a balance we can jump to either pole, but that that's what comes to mind on that. And then my other thought, I'm going to email you, uh, some Katie Bowman stuff. Cause I think you're going down a path, this lady, she's from the West coast and is super into how we've outsourced movements. Um, just random movements throughout our day. And I think would fit with this really well. So I'll send you that and see if I can get myself a footnote. <laughs> What do you mean? Uh, she's out. We've outsourced movements. Um, so I, I can only think of the tea bag analogy You're use for some the reason. Tea. But, um, Always but, the tea. But it would be anything. So like, you can go to McDonald's <laughs> and get a. You can go to get McDonald's and get a burger. But we used to have to kill a cow and then process it and then cook it and you do all this. But now you can just walk in, walk out. You know, you don't even have to talk to a person now. You can just do it on an app. They'll hand you the burger when you get there, right? Um, so, right, th- so it'd be right, like even, right. even a drive through would be a perfect example, right? You have to, you used to have to walk into the restaurant, right? But now you sit in your car and get handed it. So you don't have to get up and walk. So she thinks about it on this very small level and, uh, she calls it movement ecology mm-hmm. actually. So we'll send you those links. That's sort of an aside, but I think you're right that racing has become like a hundred percent instead of like a 1%. You know, boy, uh, how, how many hours we got for this conversation? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> we're all, we're all trying to do it. But we know one thing, because um, you're right, as you're, as you're describing that, I was thinking yesterday I was making myself a BLT, and I was getting exasperated because, like, I'll go to the fridge and get the mail, and I'm like, oh, I forgot the tomato, back from tomato, oh, shit, I forgot the egg. And I'm like, man, how many times did I open this freaking fridge? And, and, but just think about that. If I had gone to the store, I would just basically have extended my arm, and they would have put food into it. But by making it myself, you know, I had to return to the fridge four times to keep retrieving um, ingredients. It's a small thing, but it is quadruple the amount of movement that I would have gotten uh, if I just picked the thing up at the, at the store. And, and again, it really circles back to um, Dan Lieberman, the guy I wrote about in Born to Run, looking at the evolutionary model of movement, and he said, you know, as humans, we're blessed and cursed by this higher brain function, which we have a body designed for movement, but a brain which is focused on conserving energy at all costs. So we sort of have a brain override. So our brain is basically telling this body, designed for movement, don't move, because you need that energy for an emergency. Unfortunately, we've removed all the emergencies. Mm-hmm. So we're constantly in a, in a, in a, in a pre game state, but the game never arrives. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think Peter's also going to skip over. I've been campaigning for why we need a dog, and I think this conversation is is going to put me like one up. We can do things. We can get a hunting dog. That's fine. I, I, we're talking. We're talking donkeys. I mean, how do you how do you go from donkeys to dogs? Well, because we have a condo. I can't put a donkey on our back porch. I have no answer for that. <laughs> I have a whole passion plea here. Like, meh. You're right. Uh, <laughs> That's I don't know. Yeah, but, yeah, I don't know. Not to listen, my I feel like I'm ganging up on you already because I just had a few good expression of competition, and now I feel like I'm taking his side on the dog. Um, it's a, it's a tricky one because tricky one. I, I also feel for the animals, and I, and I feel like too many of us sort of buy these things the way we buy appliances, 100, percent and we don't yeah. really have the circumstances to give them the active life that they want too. Mm-hmm. I should just say, by the way, I should, dude, tell me to stay out of your personal life. Well, let's go out of bounds. No, no, it's, a, bounds. it's an open book. It's a, it's yeah. True. This is but, a but constant I, theme. It, it's on the an podcast. interesting, it is an interesting conversation, right? Because, I mean, if you look over, I guess, domestication of dogs and stuff, but I think you're exactly right that, you know, if you have a dog and you're going running, you know, and, and you know, I, it, it's helping you in a lot of ways, right? That you're going running or walking or adventuring with this dog the way, you know, a lot of dogs were meant to go and travel great distances. Um, you know, you're sort of getting this more holistic, you know, there's a relationship there. You have, you know, movement in that, you know, you're in nature. There's like a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up in that, that having the animal, oh, right? Oh, oh, wait a second. So who's the pro dog person? Is it Peter or is it Molly? 
I, I'm more using dogs as like, a, a, like you have donkeys, you know, whatever it is. Right. But you're sort of, what we do is we sort of remove ourselves and put ourselves into these houses or condos. Right. And then we've dissociated from trees. We've dissociated from moving at all. We've dissociated from any other animals, right? Animals are another thing. They're not part of humanity, right? Or, right. or part of our lives, right? As humans. Dachshund would be part of my yeah. life, Peter. Right. Dachshund, you said? Dachshund. Yes. That's yes. all I want. <laughs> well, listen, you know, you know about Catra Corbett, uh, Dirt Diva? Oh, yeah. So she runs with her uh, Dachshund, Truman. And really? that dog, that dog can can log like double digit numbers. That dog can do like twelve mile runs. Yeah, see, I was really and, opposed, and I was like, "This dog makes no sense." But then I keep running into people like in the forest doing crazy things with them, and so check out. And actually, by the way, uh, Molly, she'd be a great person to interview. Uh, and Catra has a terrific book out now. So she was. I mean, am I telling you stuff you already know? Are, are you familiar with her story? I'm familiar with her, but not like super familiar. I think I I follow her on everything, but as you know, the algorithm she's, loses uh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> she she's so much the real deal. I mean, she was a hardcore addict and mm-hmm. used running to pull herself out, and has um, had so she's done more hundred miles, I think, than any maybe even be male or female. And uh, by her side is this cool little dachshund, and I believe he's like dachshund number two. Hmm. But um, yeah, so she'll she'll if you get in a conversation with her, she will fully back you up yes. by getting it off. <laughs> you know, but, but to your but your, but your point, um, yeah, it, it, there's there's so much about it, and it's, it's kind of what I've been exploring the past couple of years with the donkeys, and it, it definitely extends to dogs. But there's another thing too: is one of my objections to the way people approach sports isn't just the competition, but it's the the sort of self-directed me, me, me aspect of it where it's, you know, it's my fitness tracker, it's, it's my watch, and it's my time, and it's my PR. And when you run with a friend, for instance, you have to think about them, listen to what they're saying, run their pace, ask them if they need some water. And when you extend that to an animal who can't communicate verbally, you've got to open up your eyes and really pay attention. And when you're with an animal like uh, a donkey, which can like take out your jaw when it's time to hump if it wants to, or, or a dachshund, they could get into real heat distress if you're not paying attention. It transforms your experience where if you do a five-mile run with a donkey, or I'm sorry, with any animal, it's over before you know it because you are so focused on the animal, you're just shutting out your own sensations in a really good way. And I just find it to be to me, it's transformed everything. I feel like my runs are so much more engrossing now than they ever were before. Now, it strikes me that I always, when I read Born to Run, I, I might have been one of the few people that took like the community and the, the you know, the food preparation and the, you know, it just being part of everyday life as, for me, that was like a big part of the takeaway. Um, whereas like, obviously the, the barefoot running and the no shoes and stuff was like the, the heavily uh, publicized one. Um, <clears throat> do you, do you think like, was that more like, what were you going for? I guess I know this is a question you've been asked, but, um, w- is that sort of in the same thinking, the same direction we're talking right now? It totally is. And it's funny because it's been a real eye opener for me, that experience, because I really thought I was writing one book and it became another book. So for me, the barefoot stuff the running shoes stuff. I almost cut the whole chapter on running shoes. Very nearly ended up on the cutting room floor. Uh, I looked at that chapter, and to me, it was kind of a dead weight. It's the only chapter that is not narrative. Uh, it's the only chapter that really doesn't have a story. And all that information was was really new to me. Um, Barefoot Ted was the first and only barefoot runner that I knew at the time, and he was definitely not the guy that I was going to rely on for scientific <laughs> evidence. So, I, I, and again, you know, I think the best bit of advice, and there's another, do you know, you might know Bill Gifford, uh, Molly, he did a lot of writing for Bicycling Magazine and writes for other magazines now, but often does about cycling. He's also a great editor, and he was one of my early editors at Philippa Magazine. And when I started working on Born to Run, he said, Keep in mind, you got to tell the story from the beginning, not from the end. Mm-hmm. Tell it as you understood these things, not the way you know them now, but as they were first presented to you. 
And so when I looked at running shoes and barefoot running, I was presenting it like, oh, it sounds like it might be right, but I'm not completely sold. And that's how I, I wanted to present it in the book. Like, here's the evidence. You decide for yourselves. But that one chapter, I, I couldn't, there's nothing I could do where I could get all that scientific information into a chapter and had to be a narrative. So I looked back as I was revising the book, I'm like, yeah, I don't know, this is kind of, this is kind of too factual and science-based. Maybe I should just cut this out. But then I thought, yeah, it's kind of important. Let's leave it in. And again, it was a real shock to me that when the book came out, people sort of zoomed in on that as the takeaway. Uh, because Peter, to your point, that's what I really thought the book was about. I thought that to me, the big reveal is that this approach we've had toward running, where it's about the next race and the faster time and getting better, 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 is wrong. And that the real approach is the Fatal Mata approach of make this about a team and a community and fellowship. And you're right. I think that is rarely the point that people take, and they really want to zoom in on the opposite of what I'm trying to say, which is how to get faster and better. Yeah, I think between the barefoot running or just like, and I mean, I will totally cop to this. I think when I first tried Born to Run, I finished it on a Wednesday, immediately looked to see if there were any trail marathons in New Jersey coming up, and there was one that Saturday, and I signed up for it and did it. <laughs> a trail marathon? Yeah. I'm oh, like, all right. yeah. to be fair, to be fair, actually, I mean, I won it. Like, I, I had, like... <laughs> I'd been Holy doing shit. Iron Man's like I was, you know, I was endurance trained. It wasn't like I was complete scrub in like running, but I had yeah. no real business like jumping into a trail marathon two days after finishing reading that book. Looking well, apparently back, you did. Yeah. I made a really good friend at that race though. And we actually stayed friends. So clearly a little, a little spark of that community thing got in my head. So I think, unfortunately, everyone who hears this podcast is now going to follow you as the bad example. They're all going to sign, hey, you make friends and you win. All yeah. you have to do is things in two days and you're good. Yeah, yeah it's great. <laughs> no, I was That'd wrecked, I was wrecked for like a month after. Like, I could not walk the next day. Because people who haven't run trails don't realize it. it's like, you know, 30% mountain climbing, you know. And so it's, there's a whole other muscle group there that's getting getting beaten up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so of everyone that you've interviewed in, in Natural Born Heroes and in Born to Run, if you had to go back, like who are just like two or three of like, who are the most standout people that you got to talk to? Like, who do you want to go hang out with right now? I'm so curious about this. Well, that's, that, see, that's a really interesting thing because one of them is a yin and yang thing. And I, I actually have gotten an email that I was in the middle of, of responding to this morning. It's Barefoot Ted. And I had to really discipline myself while writing Born to Run to not really turn the cannons on Barefoot Ted because he bugged the living shit out of me <laughs> nonstop during that experience. He drove me insane. Me and Kabai had the same reaction. Like, I think we're looking at each other like, you know, we're at the bottom of the canyon. If we actually strangled him and buried him under some rocks, I don't think anybody would ever find out. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> I was nuts. Actually, Barefoot Ted and I almost came toe-to-toe -to -toe and almost started throwing fists at each other at Badwater. We were crewing for Luis Escobar, and he was driving me so crazy that we were actually out there on the highway in the middle of Death Valley, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, like fist balled up, ready to beat the shit out of each other. Um, that said, I rarely use this word. Uh, I really love Barefoot Ted. I love the guy. I think he's a genuinely kind and generous and um, good-hearted person who is infinitely smarter than I am. I mean, he has better and smarter ideas. He's thinking ahead of me all the time. And he'll often say something, and I'll like roll my eyes and I smirk, and then two years later, I'll be saying the same thing, pretending that I came up with it. <laughs> this happens over and over again. And every time I've been involved in experience with Barefoot Ted, I look back. So at the time, I'm trying to think, I look back, I'm like, boy, that was really cool. That never would have happened without Ted. So uh, so some of the things that Ted's involved with now, so, you know, he had that really wonderful transformative moment when he had Manuel Luna 
teach him how to make a pair of Warachi sandals. At the time, we like wanted Ted to like leave Manuel alone. His mm-hmm. son was murdered. He's a quiet guy. Will you please fuck off and leave him alone? And he wouldn't. And he kept like running around like Dennis the Menace. But it was, it was a real intuitive, empathetic, empathetic genius when he got Manuel to make these sandals. So suddenly Manuel had a focus that was outside of his own breathing. So and, and when I saw it, I was like, oh, right, good idea. Well, then what Ted did was he went back to Seattle and he created a little sandal company, which he named after Manuel Luna, Luna Sandals. And again, he makes fantastic adventure sandals. They're great, great products. And every single year, he goes back to the Copper Canyon and hands Manuel Luna a fistful of cash and gives him a percentage of the proceeds, which I think to this day, Manuel, Manuel Luna has no idea why Ted's handing him this money. And he's also set up a Manuel Luna education fund. So, you know, Ted comes across as a, as a lunatic, but he is smart and he has follow through and um, he's good hearted. It's now his whole thing is this thing called Solar Wheel. Have you guys seen like the Solar Wheel stuff he's doing? No. The Solar Wheel is a freestanding wheel. It's like it's like a Segway without the uh, column upright. So it's just a wheel Whoa. with these two little foot platforms. And if you hop on this thing, and it, it has a battery pack, but it moves directionally by gravity. So. You lean forward, you go forward. You lean backwards, you go backwards. Uh, so Ted somehow got hooked up with the guy who created the solo wheel. And so now, and he has this whole theory that the optimal speed for human locomotion is about 10 miles an hour. Anything faster than that, you can't take in your, your, your surroundings. Anything slower, it gets tedious. But 10 miles an hour, and you can go back historically, like early bicycles and you know, uh, horse and buggies and things like that, and they all tend to move around 10 miles an hour. And so Ted has these solar wheels, and they've become pretty big in California and the Pacific Northwest, where, and the thing about it, too, is that you can just pick them up and carry them inside and plug them into your wall, and they'll recharge the battery. So if you're in New York, for instance, and you want to go around the city, it's got a range of, like, 20 miles. I feel like I just did a gigantic infomercial. <laughs> yeah, Ted. right? Yeah. Like, but he, his, his point is that vehicles just take up a ton of space. But mm-hmm. what if you just had the wheel, and then suddenly you remove the big metal dinosaurs from our, our landscape? So oh. your, question was, <laughs> your question was, who would I want to interview? So Barefoot Ted, first and foremost, leads the pack. Um, the second person, and I, I talk to her now all the time, is a woman named Barb Dolan, who is one of the premier borough racers of, of any age or gender. And what she has taught me about all kinds of stuff, man, but um, particularly being a champion athlete as a woman and as being um, an animal trainer has just really sort of rebooted my thinking about how to be as a person and as an athlete. I think... Um, I keep learning for her nonstop. That's awesome. It's so, I have to say, it's so weird hearing about Barefoot Ted as an actual human because I've read the book so many times that, you know, you're, you're talking about these stories from it, and I'm just like, wait, that actually happened in real life, right? Wait, wait, wait hang on. I, I, never, I, never said he was, I never said he was human. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually just a character. Yeah, well, he made know, a, I, come on, the guy's riding a solo wheel. This isn't a real person. Yeah. <laughs> Ash, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I should recommend this or not, but um, if you did a podcast with him, holy gravy. First of all, you, don't, you, know, you just have to ask him his name, and then you wouldn't have to say anything else. He would just talk for an hour. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> Easiest podcast but ever. He's is, he is, he is super interesting. I, I can only imagine. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have to, so I have to ask, Born to Run, you know, I kind of understand, like, I know where it kind of happened. You know, you started with a couple of stories for Runner's World. It, like, turned into this, oh, this could be a book. What about Natural Born Heroes? How did that one come about? Because that's about something that happened, you know, 70 years ago. And, I mean, it ties tons back into current everyday life, but how did that one grab you? You know, it was it was sort of an outgrowth of Born to Run, so 
when I went down to the Copper Canyon for that race and thought, hey, there's actually a book here. And I really wanted to research the sort of the, the, the legacy of running. And so, you know, you go to Barnes and & Noble and there's almost, there are almost no running books on the shelf. There's nothing there. There's always, you know, the usual, like, training guides, like how to put, you know, Vaseline on your thighs so you don't chase. And, but there was no really good narrative. There's only one, there's only one narrative book, which was Dean Karnazes' Ultra Marathon Man. Mm-hmm. That was the only good adventure story on the shelf. And so I started to go back through sort of rare book archives and, you know, the Gutenberg collection and A. Libris looking for books from the past about running. And one of them that I bought without really knowing what it was was called The Creek and Runner. I was going to guess again, that. I wasn't sure what, but it had, it had Runner in the title, so I figured, and I got it, and I'm like, oh, well, shit, this had nothing to do with running. It's actually about foot messengers during World War II. So I basically just put it aside while I was working on Born to Run and didn't even read it. So then I finished Born to Run, and there's a good, like, nine-month delay between the time the manuscript is finished and then it actually comes out on the bookshelves. And during that delay, I went back and was kind of sorting through all the books I had acquired, reading the ones I hadn't read yet, and I read The Cretan Runner. And this is a first-person account told by a guy named George Sikandakis, who was a shepherd when the Germans invaded the island of Crete in World War II. And he just transformed himself overnight from a shepherd into a long-distance Ultra performance athlete who was running messages between um, underground guerrilla forces on the island. And when I was reading one of his accounts, we talked about doing like a, you know, a 40 mile run through the mountains, delivering a message, getting the reply, having a little shot of uh, moonshine, and running back. And I was like, whoa, whoa, dude, he just, he just did 80 trail miles in 36 hours on a diet of whiskey. I'm like, what the hell did you just do? And I became curious, like, well, what separates these people from us? How does a civilian endure that kind of physical challenge without dying? And I thought, well, whatever it is they're doing, maybe there's, there are some transferable skills that the rest of us can adopt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was it. So I thought, well, let's look at these resistance fighters, because the thing about the resistance was... These aren't trained soldiers. These are civilians who have to respond immediately. Um, and I thought, well, whatever they were doing, these civilians were able to fight against German forces. You know, there's something there. Their diet, their way of movement, their way of training. And that's such what I focused on. I focused on that story of these resistance fighters. And in particular, what was so cool about it was, Halfway through the book, you realize what these guys had in mind, and their strategy was, you know, we we can't defeat 100,000 German soldiers on our island, but maybe we only got to get one of them. What if we go behind German lines, kidnap the general, and go on the run with him, and make the 100,000, instead of us going after them, let make them come after us. And they could basically tie up uh, an entire battalion's worth of manpower, because if they're busy chasing us around, then they're not busy fighting other people. Mm-hmm. And that's what these, these lunatics actually did. They actually snuck behind the middle lines, grabbed the general, and then they realized the hard thing about capturing somebody on an island is that you're on an island. You're like, there's nowhere to go. And that's what they did. They were on the run with this guy for, for nearly four months. Yeah, it's such an amazing book. I mean, I think everyone that listens to this podcast knows that I think everyone should read it because it's, it's just such a cool story and such a good read. Um, so I have to ask from like the nerd side first, and then I want to get back into the training for both of these books. But nerdy side, what does your writing process look like? Which I know could be like another three-hour podcast, but like in a nutshell. You know, it's a cool question because it, it was a real revelation for me when I was working on Born and Run. So with Born and Run, you know, prior to that, I had been a magazine freelancer where I always had like seven or eight assignments juggling at a time. Right. And so it's always hectic because you're, you're on the phone, you're traveling, you're writing, you're talking to editors. So your, your, your schedule is kind of dictated to you. There's, there's the stuff that has to be done moment by moment. But when you get a book contract, suddenly, you, I'm not sorry, my, I don't, I'm not familiar. Have you, have you written a book? 
Yes, actually, a, a couple different ones, fiction and nonfiction. So I, I, but while always having the like ten to fifteen articles also in the hopper at the same time, so I feel like it's probably a little okay. different. <laughs> okay, well then, and this is also a unique situation because um, you know, it's a weird thing. So what happened with Born and Run was, you know, I was, I was nonstop flea bag freelancer barely living check to check. And then I, I knew I wanted to do a book about ultramarathoners, which again, back in 2005, were still kind of below the radar a little bit. Uh, again, Dean was the only known guy who was doing ultras back then. And my, my original plan was I was going to pick four ultra runners, uh, two men, two women, uh, different parts of the country, different backgrounds, as, as different as possible and track them during the course of a year when, and then all four of them, it'd be four people who were going to run bad water. So the idea was pick somebody up in Jersey, someone in Utah, someone wherever, and then track their lives during the course of a year, culminating in the four of them uh, racing at, at, at bad water. And that's sort of my rough plan. And while I was trying to, sort of trying to find these runners and sort of sort things out, then I got involved in a Copper Canyon race, which, again, is strictly by accident. It was going to be a magazine assignment. And it was only after that race, as we're traveling back out of Mexico, I realized, oh, yeah, that, that, that race you're looking for, it, it just happened. You just saw it. <laughs> and that's when I got the idea of actually doing the book of Born to Run. So I went home and wrote a really lengthy, detailed proposal. And then we put it out in the market um, to publishers. And it was kind of a dream scenario. Half the publishers were not interested at all. You know, just didn't didn't care. The other half were pretty intrigued. And then one publisher in particular said, we want it. And they offered me enough of an advance where I wouldn't have to work for two years. Oh, wow. What the hell? Sorry. What the hell? (laughs) And so it it just transformed everything. So instead of having seven assignments that had to be done in, in six weeks, I had one assignment that had to be done in two years, which is like going on a cruise. It just seemed like it was going to stretch forever. Yep. And so the way I approached it was, at first I thought, okay, hey, you got to do the writer thing, the book writer thing, which is you go at five in the morning, you have coffee, and you sit down, and you work until midnight. I tried that for about three months, and I got nowhere. I would get up at five, and I had the coffee, and then I would just doodle around and dick around and waste time and waste time. I was getting nothing done. And then uh, I felt like it actually revealed like a, a whole psychological profile that I didn't know was there. Was I, I think I'm, a, I'm actually completely ADHD. I am completely, um, what is it, like basically motion obsessed. And I can't sit still. So what I realized is if I would just go out and play all day, like go up and just split firewood and go for a bike ride and go on errands and go out on and just, Speak around all day and just drain the tank. But as soon as the sun goes down, then I can focus. So that's what I would do. I just I just reversed policy, and instead of trying to work all day and go to sleep at night, I just played all day. And then between like eight o'clock at night and one in the morning, I would crank out ten times as much work as I would if I was just trying to sit down during the day. And and that's, wait, that's wait a second. Day. You stayed married during this time? You know, it's funny. You said that my wife just walked out the door right now as if you summoned her. <laughs> and I almost like if you hand her the phone. Uh, I'm looking at her right now. Um, because, yeah, dude, it was, not to speak too much of her behalf, but the fact that she's still here says a lot more about her than it does about me, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, and not only that, but, you know, what happened was, it wasn't just that I, I realized that I've got to, run around like um, a manic five-year-old, but then work until late at night. And then the increasing tension, you know, you become so absorbed in this story because it's, 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 it's drawing on all of your attention. You know, I've got Jen Shelton and, and Caballo Blanco and the Tato Mata on my brain. And that, that, that to me is, is the reality. So I'm living in a story that took place a year and a half ago, I'm not living in the present where I have like a wife and two kids and, and sheep, you know? So, um, yeah. So I don't know if you, I don't know if you, if you endured this with Molly, but 
you become so distracted. So, like, if you ask, if your spouse asks you a question, it just seems outrageous. Like, how dare you ask this, me about This might have dinner. happened yesterday, yeah, it actually. just happened yesterday, actually. <laughs> yeah. Someone was in a bit of flow, yeah. flow state, and... Uh, yeah. I, was, I was doing so good on this article, and then he was on the phone with, like, the IRS or something, and, like, trying to hand it to me, and I'm just glaring at him. Right. I know. It's, and it's funny, then later on, you come out of your fugue state, and you realize, oh, that was unreasonable, but at the time, you just seemed like, how dare you, you? psychopath? Yeah. You can't ask me a question. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. So has yeah. it changed since that first book? Are you still... Because, I mean, it's it's 10 a.m. there, and, and you were, I think, working a little writing this morning, or were you, like, running up and down the hill trying to get ready to write? Uh, no, I was just answering an email from Barefoot Day. That was it. Uh, so, no, I did, so far this morning, you know, what have I done? I took a friend for a walk. We uh, have this, like, little swimming hole in the creek, so I took up there and Showed the swimming hole and fed the cats, fed the goats, fed the turkeys, fed the geese. Uh, no, I've been picking around uh, since since the sun came up. Um, yeah. The sad thing is that I feel like there's like a boot camp process with Born to Run where I learned a lot about how to write a book, and I vowed that I would never make the same mistakes again. And then mm. I turned around and just did the same thing for the next book, and I'm doing the same thing now. So I don't know, man. I feel like maybe writing a book is like the early stages of flight, you know, that the technology is just insufficient and all you can hope for is to just, you know, get away from the wreckage without, you know, too many broken bones. But, yeah, it's, you know, I think about the thing about always as you and I are commiserating. I mean, everybody else is rolling their eyes. Like, oh, boo fucking who? Too bad for you, yeah, writers uh, in your pajamas. It's, it's true. I am so, still I wearing know, pajamas. I, I, yeah, I, I dig it. It's great to be able to make money by um, telling stories. But it's um, yeah, it's it's its own challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like I'll add to that, like I've never stopped doing freelance work while I was writing books because the problem with that is like, you you know you can probably, un you know you probably have dealt with this. Like you kind of have to make the decision. Okay, if I don't take any freelance work for two years, those magazines you know might not have room for me when I come back up for air and I mean obviously not the case and you're you know didn't happen like that for you but that's what I always worry about when I'm in deep on a book project well it's interesting you're, I think you're right uh, I, I, I never get magazine offers uh, it's not like magazines are calling me up saying hey you, know, you want to do a story for us uh, you got to remain on the top of the pecking order which means you got to be producing content for an editor or else we move on to the next person they're yeah. not you know flipping through magazines, like, ooh, who can we recruit for this story? Oh, I wonder if, you know, Molly's available. No, if you haven't done something for them in the past couple of months, and they forget you exist. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a hamster wheel sometimes. In, like, the greatest way, again, we get to write for a living. This is awesome. But, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a little tough. Um, so going back, if, you know, since you have to obviously move around a bunch during the day to kind of calm down enough to write, what were you like as a kid? Were you super athletic? Were you fidgety? What well, yeah? What was your childhood athletics More, like? Well, uh, so a few years ago, um, I was invited to this uh, symposium at Harvard with Dan Lieberman and a guy named Dr. John Rady, R A T E Y, and he is a Harvard uh, medical school psychiatrist who specializes in attention deficiency. And he wrote a great book called Spark. And Spark is essentially basically saying, you know, human animals in adolescence should not be sitting in chairs. And if you mm -hmm. wonder why kids act up in class, it's because he's in class. So I was familiar with this book. I hadn't read it yet, and I hadn't met him. And so as we meet him and Lieberman on this symposium, and they had a little uh, a meet and greet beforehand with the president of Harvard University. So when I got there, and I was introduced to Ray, I was shaking his hand, and we started to chat. And he said, well, you know, of course, you with your attention deficiency in school, you must have had a really hard time with academics. I'm like, Dude, I'm not ADHD. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you totally are. And he's like, look at yourself. You came late. You came running in. You grabbed some food. You hugged Lieberman. You almost knocked over the president of Harvard while you're coming over to say hi to me. You've been bouncing around like a freaking tennis ball since you've been here. And as he said it, part of me was like irate. Like, dude, you don't fucking know me. And the second <laughs> part of me was like, this makes so much sense. And I felt like my entire, it was like, the movie The Sixth Sense, you know, I thought like Bruce Willis in the air, like, oh, it all makes sense now. <laughs> and so as a 
as a kid, I was, um, you know, I think, naturally gifted. I was a good student. I really liked to read, but I couldn't sit still. So teachers who got that could, like, manage me like a freaking circus animal. And the ones who didn't just uh, would just go to war with me. So I alternated between doing really well or, being, or staying out in the hall. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was sports, you know, I, I really liked basketball, but I was never really any good. Uh, I got into rowing uh, toward the end of high school and into college, and that would definitely bring the batteries. So yeah, I think particularly in college, you know, we'd have a two-hour practice, and I'd be fried, and then I could actually sit through a, through a two-hour lecture. Okay. So yeah. what turned you on to running? What made you? What made that click for you in the beginning? It didn't. It didn't really click. So... And I came into Born to Run as a, pretty much a non-runner. Uh, you know, I, I rode competitively through college and then I graduated. And, you know, you graduate and all you're doing is like, it's like working and drinking and, you know, goofing around. And so a couple of years out of college, suddenly you realize like your clothes don't fit and you feel like shit because you haven't worked out in two years. So uh, like everybody else, I thought, well, I'll, I'll run. I'll get back in shape. I'll run marathons. But I'm big, you know, I'm six foot four, and back then I was around 250 or so. So I would run, and I would get injured, and I would go see doctors, and they'd say, well, you know, dude, you're the size of the fridge. Of course you're injured. You shouldn't be running. You know, the human body's not, not meant for this kind of pounding. And I, and I believe them. So I gave up running, and I hadn't run a step in years prior to getting into assignment from Rivers World to get down to the Copper Canyon. And... You know, I, I, I fully believed what I'd heard over and over again. You know, the body, the human body is not meant for this kind of pounding and only the most cushioned shoes can you possibly sustain it. And this was the current operating thinking mm-hmm. all the time. I heard it everywhere. And then I got out of Copa Canyon and I meet Caballo. And this is the weird thing about it was Caballo was my height, my shoe size. And he was my age when he first went down to the Copper Canyon, and he was also trying to recover from injuries. So he had turned himself around mm-hmm. by running like a power mother. So that's what sort of opened my eyes. And so when he said, come back in nine months, let's do this race. Can you, you know, run a 50-mile race? I was extremely skeptical because, again, I had not run a step in years prior to that. I, like, I don't know. I don't think it's going to work. And it was that experience. And it's what... The real, real breakthrough was to buy maybe the offer, but the person who made it possible was Eric Orton. He is a coach based out of Jackson Hole, and I just met him by accident on an assignment for Men's Journal, and he said, "Yeah, dude, you can totally transform yourself as a runner. I can help you do it." And that's what made me think. All right, listen, I, I think it's not going to work, but a, a failed story is as good as a successful story. So. I can try this process, and either way, I win. So I had Eric train me, and his approach to running was so um, revelatory in the sense of, like, everything I thought was true, he said the opposite, and his way worked. And again, it changed everything. And now it's been, I don't know how many years now, since 2006 was the Copper Canyon race, so it's been about 12 years. And is that right? Yeah, 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 12 years. And right now, I feel like I can go out the door and run whatever I feel like with no even even thought of injury. I, I just don't get hurt anymore. And you you had foot pain or something before, did you not? Yeah, I, I had a variety of problems, but the one which was the sealer was like cuboid syndrome. Uh, so yeah. I had this acute pain on the outer edge of my foot, you know, sort of opposite my arch. It was blinding pain and. The doctor that went to see said, yeah, it's, you know, you, your, your foot's malfunctioning, you're getting the orthotics, you're getting the cortisone. And oh, fuck that, I'm done then. And I, it's never, it's never recurred. Um, but I think there, there are two elements about it. The thing about Eric is that his approach to running is make it playful. Very, you know, you go fast, you go slow, you go long, you go short, constant variety as opposed to banging out five miles a day every day at the same pace. And the second thing is focusing on form, like change the way you move your legs. And those two things together have made it really fun and not a, not an injury risk. And you would have ramped up within that sort of constant variation. There would have been a sort of gradual exposure, I imagine, as well. 
But, you know, it's interesting, Peter. So one thing that Perry did, um, which still works in the day with me, which, again, I feel so counterintuitive, is, you know, we're going from zero miles to 50 miles in nine months, which is a pretty severe ramp-up. Um, but he focused a lot on speed. And it's something that the Emil Zadopek did back in the 40s and 50s when he was training for marathons. He said, I want to start with a 100-yard dash to get really good at running fast, and then I'll worry about running long. And to this day, when my legs feel the worst, I'll force myself to do a drill that Eric would have me do, which was do like a, like a four-mile run, two miles out, just jogging, and then on two miles back, do 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Uh, hard as fast you can for 30 seconds, jog 30 seconds, sprint 30, jog 30. And for some reason, it revives your legs. So hmm. running fast and hard for some reason um, makes your legs feel better than if you're just taking it easy. Right. So which book got you in better shape? Fascinating question. So I would have to say Natural Born Heroes. That's what I thought but, you'd say, and I was hoping you'd say. <laughs> okay. Well, let's back up a second. Tell me about your parkour stuff. So the advance basically is parkour, is, is, is some, because of parkour. But tell me your experience with that. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've, I've always kind of found it sort of interesting because I knew a couple of kids in high school who did it. And then I can't remember if it was that I read something about Natural Born Heroes and then like jumped into a couple of parkour classes, or I'd read Natural Born Heroes and jumped into it. But either way, I was reading it around the same time I went to a few. Um, in the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania, there's actually like a pretty solid parkour community. And I was yeah. like at home with my parents. Down. Yeah. Oh. Um, and I was home with my parents in New Jersey. So I was going over there for a few classes. And I mean, I suck at it. Like, let's just be honest. But like the first time I went, you know, we're running around, we're doing the push ups and stuff. And the guy's just like, okay, you're not good at this, but like, what do you do? I was like, oh, I, I'm a triathlete. And he's like, oh, that makes sense. Because I could do the running. I could do the push-ups. But like when it comes to, you know, jump up and land on this beam, I was useless. Still kind yeah. of am, <laughs> as it turns out. But I'm trying. Um, no, I just think it's so much fun. And I, I mean, I love trail running. And I keep telling people to take a couple parkour classes if they're going to, like, if they want to improve their trail running. Because I think the two just have so much in common. Well, yeah, you know, it's too bad. So, you, you know, there's, there's these two guys uh, um, out of Kutztown, which isn't too far from Lehigh Valley, and they're among the best coaches, um, Adam and Andy. Uh, Is it have, Adam and, McClellan? And Alex, yep, exactly. That's and who Andy I had. Him. He's amazing. Yeah. He's amazing, and I think, uh, I, I feel like I want him as my life coach. He has a like, beautiful voice, and he he's just this kind, assertive presence. Um, and, and Andy's the same way. So they're like the same dude. Um, but what's interesting, did you ever see the video Movement of Three? Yes. So those women teach an all-women's parkour jam in London. And the thing about it is I love Adam and Andy. I think they're fantastic guides and leaders in parkour. But there's just something different about a group, and actually Dan Edwards, who's a great coach in the UK, he actually says it's like, in any group of guys, there's going to be three pains in the asses, period. There's going to be the show-off, there's going to be the explainer, and there's going to be the trickster. Yes. Every group of guys has those three fucking idiots. <laughs> They're not there in a women's group. Women just actually do the thing, you know? Yep. They're not trying to show off, they're not trying to prank, they're just doing the activity. And I did um, a workout with this all women's group. It was all women and me. The best, man. It was so, because everyone's just helping each other, paying attention, trying hard. And so I feel like if you had that experience, and I'm sure as good as it was with Adam, it was great, but if you'd been with a group of girls, um, you would just been so inspired. Yeah, there were a couple girls in the one class I took, and then I actually did a couple of privates with Adam. Um, and yeah, the women in, in the ones I took were super rad. Like by the time we finished, I was like, can we be best friends? And I, I didn't live there, so we couldn't, but. Well, you know, there's a, so, sorry, are you guys near Toronto? Is that what you said? We're like an hour and a half out. Do you know of good parkour in Toronto? I'm trying to remember where I was. It had to be Toronto. 
it had to be Toronto. There, yes. there is a couple there's gyms. A woman, like, there's one called the Monkey Gym or something like that. I, I'm I'm dragging my memory. I'm going to find this stuff and send it to you because yes. I was pretty sure it had to be Toronto. So I was on this manic book tour for like three years, where it was like a different place every single day. And now I just forget. So I remember the, the events. I remember the people. I literally cannot remember the city. And so I'm almost positive as Toronto, and there's a woman there, and she's part of this international parkour freak, and she's the best. She's so cool. And I went and trained with her when I was there. So I'm going to have to find her name in that group, and I'm pretty sure it's, uh, if it's Toronto. But I'll connect you with her. And, man, you guys would be like blood, blood sisters for life. Because, that would be amazing. Uh, she's the greatest. Yeah. And, you know, the reason I brought movement three is when you watch that video, and I've watched it like a million times, what stays with me is they're laughing at the beginning, they're laughing at the end, and they are all focused in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's what parkour should be. This is fun. It's playful. But I'm going to execute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now that it's been a few years, and obviously you're you're into burrow racing, uh, what practices do you keep up from either of those books? And I also want to add in the nutrition practices, too, because... I thought it was really interesting in Born to Run, you know, it, it, there's a lot of discussion of, like, Scott Jurek's a vegan, like, the, um, you know, the diet tended to be more on, like, the carb side, and then in Natural Born Heroes, it got very into the fat-adapted craze, we'll say, but, like, the kind of roots of it, I guess, and also into the foraging, which I now want to do a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So what's your diet and training like now? So, I mean, I think the good news is that the takeaways that... So, you know, when, when I would research these things or be exposed to them for the books, I was always a newcomer. So I was a newcomer to fat adaptation and ketosis, and I was a, a newcomer to barefoot running. And so as I'm writing about them in the book, I am literally describing my own experience at that moment. Mm-hmm. And so it's been really gratifying to me to look back years later and think, oh, yeah, they, they, these actually check out. I'm still doing these things. It wasn't just like a fad, like a shake weight that I tried and then, you know, stuck in the closet and never did again. I run the same way, eat the same way, train the same way, and orient myself the same way uh, as the things I was discovering when I was on those adventures. So, uh, so starting with nutrition, that was that was actually perplexing for me because I had the example of the Tata Mata and Scott Jorick for Born to Run, and then I get to Crete, and it's the exact opposite. These dudes are like all meat all the time. Mm-hmm. And... Them all, you know, and Scott just ran the freaking Appalachian Trail in about 25 minutes eating, like, tortillas. How, how do you do that? And my, my takeaway was I'm, I'm basically convinced that fat adaptation is, is the way. You know, it's, um, it is, in terms of evolutionary history, this is the way humans have eaten and the way the human animal has always eaten for millions of years. The difficulty we run into now as uh, a culture is that we have ethical decisions about how food is processed and how animals are treated, and we have too many options available on the shelves. And I think if you're looking for guidance in the wilderness, it is the the mindfulness. Just be aware of what effect certain foods have on your body and make your decisions that way. And that's why I felt like ultimately the person who came up with the perfect um, decision about how to eat was was Phil Moffatone, the guy who came up with the two-week test. And, you know, what I love about Phil is, you know, he's a product in the 70s. He's a pure flower child. He's not going to try and tell you what to do. You know, he's not a preacher. You know, he's a guide. And so Moffatone came up with this idea of doing a two-week test where you remove all the high glycemic foods from your diet for two weeks. So get rid of all the bread, pasta, sugars, fruits, anything that's going to jack your insulin rate. Remove those things for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, you reintroduce a little bit of a glycemic food, like a little bit of hummus or a piece of bread, and see how you feel. Mm-hmm. What's interesting about that reboot, what that reboot is, that you, you instantly feel the effects. So for the first time, you know, the, the piece of bread is not just being processed like everything else. Like you eat the bread and you feel it. And if you feel nothing and you're great, then you're good. If you feel bloated and sluggish and sleepy, like you need a cup of coffee, and clearly that piece of bread is more, is a higher glycemic food. You don't, you don't process it well. 
Right. So for me, the two-week test has yet become the gold standard. And, and I repeat it myself uh, periodically because now I'll start off, I'll be doing good. After a few months, you know, I'm getting sloppy and I'm feeling it. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm sluggish, I'm heavy, I'm, I'm not feeling as well. So I'll do a two-week test, reboot, and then get my orientation back. Um, you know, Tim Noakes had this, this expression, like, you, you can't outrun a bad diet. And I, I think, and Peter, I, yeah, I bet you see this with cyclists a lot, too. I think it's, it's a sport where somehow you see dudes who are cranking out hundreds of miles at a time and yet never losing weight. Is that something pretty common that you see? Yeah, most of my clients are master's age, right? So they're all, you know, balancing family and, you know, busy work schedules and everything else, right? And middle age and aging even. Um, and like you say, you know, they they may have been able to outrun it as they were younger or, you know, before kids or before they became executives, but it gets hard, right? And it's, they think, a lot of us think, you know, we can just power, 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 you know, more hours, harder, harder, harder. But, you know, a lot of times that dietary change is, is tougher for whatever, the host of reasons, right? Much rather run a couple miles and still eat my cookie. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the taking the cookie out and taking the mile out never sort of crosses and just going nope. to, going to bed, right? <laughs> well, again, which is which is an interesting thing because you know uh, my wife is in New York. She came back, come back with some black and white cookies. I would cut off a finger rather than miss the chance to eat a black and white cookie. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm not going to deprive myself of that beautiful pleasure of life uh, for what reason? But the difficulty I think people get into is they end up in this frustration cycle of like. They, run a ton of, they ride a ton of miles to lose weight, but they don't lose the weight. And if you're, what's the point? And then they stop riding the miles. And so it becomes this battle on and off. And then they, they don't ride, and they feel heavier, and they start again. So uh, Noakes' point is, look, you just got to figure out the food. You got to dial it in, and you get to come up with some kind of realistic strategy, or else you will never be happy. And so that's sort of where I am today is that I understand what I have to do. I don't always do it. Um, matter of fact, just so I get off the phone, there's this Amish woman that makes this homemade peach pie, and this is peach season. So I'm busting ass over there as fast as I can to get peach pie. <laughs> but Good the man. thing about it is I understand, I understand the price I'm going to pay. I'm going to eat that peach pie. I'm going to feel sluggish all afternoon, and I'm going to regret it a little bit. But uh, I'm not going to try and think, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll run five miles and they'll compensate. It won't. You know, I just have to eat less peach pie in the future. Yeah, a friend of ours had a, he's by no means a dietary specialist or anything, he's just a regular guy, but he, he coined the phrase, uh, the worth it diet. And so in, in the case of the once a season peach pie or the, you know, cookies coming home from New York, you know, that could be worth it. But like, you know, the cookies getting dropped off at work every day at lunch or the box of donuts, you know, not worth it. And you stick to your, you know, whatever. What is the little lots of vegetables a little bit of meat or whatever yeah mostly you know not too much yeah yeah michael Pollan. that's michael the one i'm Pollan looking for yeah. not too much you know yeah and i think eat, that's eat, eat real eat real food mostly vegetables not too much that's the yeah <laughs> but not nine words that's it that's all you need to know um but yeah i, I think your point of you know the worth of thing is so the question is like so when you look at my uh scott george who's a vegan I don't agree with that diet. I think he makes his job a thousand times more difficult than it needs to be, yet he feels great about himself. He's utterly mindful. He thinks about his diet constantly because it's really hard mm -hmm. to get the caloric energy you need on that kind of a diet. Um, but I think the reason why it works for Scott is because it makes him super focused all the time on getting what he needs. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the answer. You know, no what's going to happen when you put this stuff in your mouth. Yeah, for sure. I think we need to be respectful of this man's time. He's been sitting on top of a hill for a while. <laughs> you, heard, you heard that clarion call for peach pie, too. Yeah, yeah right? Like, yeah. This, this uh, poor man yeah. just wants his pie. Is, is, is that the donkey or his stomach <laughs> grumbling? I'm not sure what's going on. All right. Last question. Where can everybody find you on the interwebs? I, I'm, I'm trying to become less... Um, responsive because boy man you just sort of suck up your life so I'm probably on Twitter more than I should be uh, usually ranting about politics a little bit but yeah on Twitter I've kind of stayed away from Facebook entirely so um, I've got a website chrismcdougal.com mm -hmm. and I'm on Twitter cool. and then we'll see what happens a year from now when the book comes out maybe I'll, I'll try and get back on Facebook that was actually going to be what I was going to say What is there a projected date for when this next one's coming out 
Yeah, so um, I'm going to be finishing it this summer, probably in the next four to six weeks. And I think the plan is it will be out um, next spring. Nice. All right. I'm so excited to read it. This this might make us have to move to a ranch and get donkeys. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be it. It's like, that's going to be the new barefoot. It's just going to be everyone's getting donkeys now. That is my global plan. We would be a happier place if we had a donkey to pet. If we had donkeys in our condos. Donkeys in our condos. Donkeys that's, in the that's condos. That's my motto. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the condo board at our next meeting and demand a change <laughs> in the, <laughs> the yeah. rules. Yeah. Awesome. Don't tell them they live. Don't tell them they live for seventy years though. Yeah. Right. Short lifespan. Super short yeah. lifespan. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna send you that yeah. flower, the world's oldest donkey link, so you you have proof. <laughs> and you and you will get and you will get your footnote. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This is so great. I, you know, there's there's always that line that you're never supposed to meet your heroes, but this has been an absolute pleasure, and I love everything you write. I'm so excited for this new book. Well, thank you, Molly. Thank you, Peter. So yeah, let, let's um, yeah, I'd, you know, contact me again. Let's do this again in the future if you want to. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. Take care. <laughs> Hey guys, before you take off, we just wanted to jump on here and talk a little bit about the Wide Angle Podium donor drive that's going on this August. So Wide Angle Podium is a member-supported network. They have tons of awesome shows, you know, in addition to us, obviously. We have the Slow Ride podcast, there's uh, Crosshairs, uh, so many other really cool cycling-specific podcasts. I think we might be the only non-cycling-specific one on the network, so it's pretty rad that they let us, you know, hang out with them. Yeah, it's definitely a uh, conglomerate. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it sound like they're in some kind of, like, skyscraper building. and No, in, in fact, it's quite different. It's all just regular people who are talking and trying to get, you know, people like Katie Compton or... We just had Chris McDougal today that you just listened to, and it's, it's you know, bringing this content that hopefully is, you know, very near and dear to your heart, you know, whether you're a cyclist or something like that, it's, it's very specific, right? And that's this day and age, you know, we're not paying NBC for our pay- cable package. I mean, you've cut the cord. You're not paying for cable anymore. Who does that? So it's really now, you know, you pay maybe Apple for your, your $10 Apple Music, and then you... Uh, yeah. Netflix? Maybe you're Netflixing and chilling. I don't know what you choose to do with your own time, but that, that would be an option. And then, you know, maybe some YouTube in there. And then you got your wide angle podium, right? So you're getting your podcast and it's a very specific show, right? There's no more channel surfing. You know that these, you know, five, five different shows, maybe you listen to as a cyclist or, you know, maybe you listen to us for sort of this all around stuff. And then maybe you have like a, another show that you listen to that's about something else like dogs or something, but. Slowly, our show is merging into a dog show. I was going to say. Anyway, though, uh, if you end up supporting Wide Angle Podium, which you can do if you go to wideanglepodium.com slash donate, uh, you not only get to help out shows like ours, you also get some sick bonus content. We actually put a lot of time this summer into recording a couple of bonus episodes with some pretty high-level people about some pretty cool topics. Uh, We put together a couple handouts and PDFs as well, so... You get bonus content from us as well as from all of the other podcasts. So really, really it should good be a stuff. lot, right? Like yeah. we, we we put in three or something. Is that uh, what it was? This year we have three, three episodes. But there's a I imagine all the older stuff is in there too, and there was some really good stuff from last year and the year before too. Yep, and yeah, like I said, a couple new handouts with some some of the stuff that we talk about on the show, kind of put into here's like an easy way to put this stuff into practice. Uh, so yeah, it's. It's really great if you can help support us and the network. We will be forever grateful. You will be our best friends. Cross is coming, so you're probably going to see us at some races. So how great would it be to get to come up and be like, hey, I support your show. I would give you some stickers then, probably some some Shred Girls swag. If you I was wondering what you that. were going to offer on top. I'm like, hey, be careful. What if this goes really well? I'll buy you lunch if you're like one of the highest Beers owners. for everyone. Molly Herford. <laughs> You know what? If you if you support the show with over twenty bucks a month, I will buy you a beer at the next cross race. I mean, that we are I think at. if there's no at, problem, I think at any if, at any level, they still have to find you, right? So what That's what are true. the chances that this is going to backfire? Uh, I feel like at Gloucester, I'm going to lose a lot of money. Yeah, but how much does a beer actually cost? I mean, you, at Gloucester, <laughs> if someone gives to you and you give back. And then you have a beer. I feel like that's that was like meant to happen. That's a I will spend on that beer. That's it. I'm offering the okay, beer now. Okay, there we go. If you donate, 
screenshot the email or screenshot the email that says you're donating find one of us at a cross race and we will buy you a beer you don't think Done. we can do this on less board like we'll just trust them no i want a screenshot oh and they're gonna have to bring a piece of paper too no just just their phone oh a screenshot yeah i guess i guess you can do that now you've cut the cord you got into the cloud come on i'm just saying all right do that we'll buy you a beer you'll make our day anyway so wide angle podium bonus content we got bonus content <laughs> All right. I, you know, I'm really wondering. I want to know what the bonus content is for, like, the crosshairs. And they probably have some really good stuff. Because this last episode they just did, we talked about that last show. I thought that was, like, one of the best things I've ever listened to. Well, now Peter you're giving Sagan. it away for free. No, no, no. This is just the show they did. Um, but they had Peter... Did it, was no, it? they didn't. I made up Peter Sagan. That was just hype. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously they have Peter Sagan as the bonus content. I mean... Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I'm not promising that. That's not my show. But who did they have on that was amazing and I was excited about it? They had Matthew Vanderpool. I mean, that's just like Peter Sagan. Okay. Although Peter, they also developed hype, I think, around the fact that Peter Sagan doesn't know who Vanderpool is or something. You're getting really into the weeds here, dear. Yeah. Anyway. Filibuster? (laughs) Wide angle podium dot com slash donate. Do it and we'll buy you a beer. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, you can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out WideAnglePodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week... Uh, Do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. Takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.